Hello, hello, everybody. Good morning. How's everyone feeling today? Raise your hand if you were over across the hall for that last session with Casey Neistat. How was that? Was that fun? Yeah, anyone seen him before? Was it your first time? Nice, very inspiring stuff, and you guys are rolling right in. Our first session of the day is done. Here we are on the optic stage. This is for everything outdoor travel culture. We're kicking things off with a bang. Check your schedules. De definitely take note of all the other activities that are happening, all the other rooms. A quick cheat sheet. Like I said, this is the optic stage. Right next door is depth of field with a portrait focus, wedding, a business focus. And then the last stage on your left is the creative production stage with another group of YouTubers and content creators who are on the front lines of our changing world and our changing social media. So look for more inspiration. But I know you guys are excited to hear. We have Frank Smith who's joining us on stage. And a very big thank you to the sponsor, OM System, for bringing him here. L ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, Frank Smith. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Well, first of all, a special thanks to B&H for uh, having me here. And of course, a special thank you to OM Systems who's, uh, who's sponsoring this. And um, I'm going to give you a fast, action-packed uh, presentation. And I say that because I have so much content that I want to share with you. The first couple minutes of the presentation, we're going to dig into a little bit of the fundamentals. So bear with me on that part because it's all going to bleed into the portion of this where we travel. So with that being said, let's jump into this. Here's what I mentioned. I'm going to give you a quick little snapshot of who I am, and then we're going to talk about the fundamentals. So I was asked to share with you what goes through my head when I'm out and about thinking about photographing a particular location. What are the, what's the process? What do, I, what do I go through? What do I think? What do I plan? So I want to share some of that with you, and then I'm going to share with you the images and the results of some of that. So with that being said, let's talk about, you know, quickly, I'm part of the OM ambassador team. Uh, my bio is on their website. You can see it on my own website, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But long story short on that, people say, what kind of photographer you are? And I say, I'm an outdoor photographer. Well, you know, wildlife, landscape, anything, you know, that's outside of the uh, normal four walls. So I do some architectural work too, but that's my sweet spot. Um, I'm part of uh, the ambassador program. There's about a dozen and a half of us in North America. And again, you can take a look at it. Very diverse set of skill sets, some really, really talented people. So if you have the opportunity, obviously, please uh, take a moment to check them out. So my equipment, I'm not here to talk about that. But obviously, with what I do, it's an extremely important part of my life, if you will. My two workhorses, as you see, is the OM-1 and the OM-5. Uh, feel free to stop down at a booth if you're interested in wanting to see any of that afterwards. But that's, that's what I have out and about when I'm in a lot of the challenging environments that I deal with. So first thing out of the gate is I got to have an objective. What is, what's my expectations? And I always go to a location with a vision, but I allow myself the flexibility to deviate from what that plan might be because Mother Nature will show you a curveball periodically. Transportation logistics sometimes get screwed up. So there's challenges. So I always have an alternative in place when I am there, but I always start with an initial vision. So the other piece to this then that I get asked about is composition. What do I look for? What am I seeing? What am I trying to find? And so what I would encourage you to do is, from the standpoint of the start point, do your research, but when you're at a location, be curious, be creative. I'm one of those guys that will peek under the log or look over top of things, and I'm gonna get, I'll show you some examples of that as we get into it. And I believe that the curiosity aspect bleeds to the creative part of this, and again, if you allow yourself to get past that initial reaction of seeing the image and ready to jump in, I think you'll find some extremely fun results in that. The other thing is when I'm photographing, I'm always thinking about trying to tell a story. How does that relate to the audience and what do they, what do I want to have them understand? So once I'm in that arena, then I have to define my subject. And I always have a primary, a secondary, and then maybe some other options. Again, this will all come together as soon as we start looking at some of the images. I love layers. 
And again, in my imagery, you're going to see that in many places. And again, I think it's a proven point that the human brain likes to see those to sort of things. So again, out and about, be thinking about that. The other thing is contrasting elements, both from the standpoint of color and light. Those two balance and work well and create interest. And again, another, another important part. Um, I, I have noted here balance when I say balance on that. Again, I don't want to weigh something too high, too high or too low on either side. Again, we'll look at a few of those examples. Separation, I'll show you some examples of what I try to accomplish with that. Depth of field as a landscape photographer is extremely important. So I'm always sensitive to my, you know, what my aperture settings are. How much of the image do I want my audience to focus on? Do I want the entire thing? Or do I want just a small part of it to draw your eye to it? Again, we'll look at some things like in that regard too. Distractions, you know, if there's a coffee cup in the foreground, take a minute, go move it out of the way. Some branches may not be in your right position, so I'm gonna either move or try to have that move. So I will be thinking about that, but minimizing that obviously will make your audience uh, more attuned to it. And then the other thing is know the rules, you know, rule thirds, all those rules, but allow yourself to break them. I think it's important to understand them, but I think it's equally important to know that you have the flexibility to go beyond that. So location wise, you know, are you looking for the iconic uh, or something that you're trying to find in your own? A lot of times I want to go to a location that has the iconic piece to it, but at the same time, I want to find my own part. I want it to be a Frank Smith image, if you will. So I allow myself those flexibilities to, to find that. Do whatever research is necessary. If you have the option to scout it ahead of time, of course, that's always a great option. And then the next thing I noted here is a guide. If you're in a remote location, a guide is invaluable. But I've learned, and I made this mistake many times over the years, is somebody says, Frank, I, I'm the, I know exactly where the secret spots are. I know exactly what you want to see. And I think, wow, that's really great. But if they're not a photographer or with a photography background, that can backfire because I've been taken to so many locations, it's high noon, the, lo the primary subject's in the wrong location, the sun's shining right out at me, so be sensitive to that. If, you can, if you're looking for assistance, try and find somebody who can help you in that regard. Transportation logistics, I don't have to tell you, you just got to be smart about how that's going to work. Do you need a four-wheel drive? Is it something that you, know, you can use a car or not? Uh, location tools, we are very blessed to have so many tools available to us that we can pretty much use many of them to help us find the locations, but then find where the right compositions are and things of that nature. Time of year, time of day, of course, very, very important. And again, that's going to spend a lot of time on that. And again, also mentioned about the planning apps, weather apps and so forth. Got to be sensitive to that. So tools. The first line item here is the basics that you're going to need to make yourself comfortable, because if you're not comfortable in the environment you're at, it's going to show in your imagery. So again, I'm not going to spend time on that. Gear for me is, you know, we all have good gear, but you want to make sure that you know it well. You want to make sure you have a good knowledge of that understanding. I always like to take a second camera with me just in case I drop in the water, what have you. You want to be in that position. But for me, a lot of the tools that are in the cameras today are amazing. And with the system I use, I have what's called computational tools. And it allows me all types of additional flexibilities, which also minimizes my load. And again, I'll share with you some examples of how that uh, comes into play. Lenses, you know, for landscape, you know, pretty much soup to nuts. You want to be wide and you want telephotos. You want to be able to compress. You want to go, you know, with a super wide. Again, if you have the option to take that with you, that's, that's key. Tripods, I'm using them less and less unless I'm doing astro or what's called, what I call live composite. It's a system in our camera where we do up to six hour exposures. You got to have a tripod for that. Filters, I carry two filters with me, polarizer and an ND, and uh, that's all I take anymore. Memory cards, batteries, all that stuff. And if you're in a foreign country, obviously make sure you want to have an adapter. So camera settings. I'm going to leave you with two things that I feel very strongly about and it's very easy is shoot raw, especially if you're a landscape photographer. You're going to have challenges with light and so forth and the extra information that's in that raw data, it's just going to be so worthwhile. Learn manual and at a minimum shoot uh, in aperture priority. So 
Those are the only two tidbits I'm going to say as it relates to camera settings. There's a whole host of other things we could be talking about. And by the way, if anybody wants a summary of these, just shoot me an email. I'm glad to give that to you. So uh, let's, let's move on here. So post-processing, absolutely. And you know, so many times people will indicate that you know, that's not, you're not a purist in that regard. There isn't a camera made that's going to emulate the, the image that you see the way you see it and the way you want it to be. So again, you got to have those skill sets. The thing that I like to decide early on in my shoot is do I want photo realism or do I want an artistic view? So when I'm there at first, that's in the back of my head. So the reason I'm mentioning that right now is that in post-processing, I'm starting the post-processing process right when I'm at the subject matter. So I'm already thinking, what can I do for this image? What do I need to make it right? And that part starts when I'm in the field. Software, my two primary workhorses, Lightroom, Photoshop, with a whole host of filters associated with that. So having said all that fundamental stuff, let's put it into some practical aspects. Let's go travel. So the first image I want to share with you is an image I shot some years ago. And my good friend Alex McClure is here. I don't know if he's in the room today or not, but he and I went out there. And this is an example where I'm talking about layers. So this young lady came up out of this uh, one uh, trailer we were at, and I asked if she wouldn't mind just standing there. This is called False Kiva. And we had timed it so we wanted beautiful skies. We wanted to obviously make sure we incorporated that. But again, as you're going to see in some of these images, you're going to, if you can, you'll, you can count the many layers that are in there, again, which is a very important part to what, what we want to accomplish. Of course, we recognize this, and if you've ever driven anywhere near Utah, this is the, the, uh, the location on their license plate. I went there with the intent of wanting to photograph the stars. And uh, we arrived probably around 10, 11 o'clock at night, and this shot was taken around midnight. But that's not the shot that I wanted. I was a little concerned. You can see in the imagery, there's a little bit of light from the town in the background, it has some clouds, has some stars. I was a little nervous about that. What I wanted, and I heard me mention about live composite, this is an hour and 10 minute exposure. I just, I didn't move the camera. I just changed my setting and I created a raw single image. No, it didn't, I didn't have to take this back in the post process. And this is ultimately what I was after. And this is what an hour and 10 minutes of that will give you. And again, for me, it's, real, it's, it's a real pleasurable thing. But the question that begs to be asked is, how do I have the light on the arch? We put a little LED red light underneath. It's so small that the human eye can't even detect it. But yet, in a long exposure like that, it's able to be uh, determined. So people have asked me, what's one of my favorite locations to travel to? And that is in the Atacama Desert. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but that's in South America. It's the largest arid desert in the world. And in the very center core of it, very, it sees very few human beings over the time. And again, it was just an amazing opportunity to see this place. But as I'm photographing again, and you see the image, are you seeing layers in here? Again, creating that element of interest be, is such an important part of, uh, of us you know, delivering an image that, that we think is appropriate. I'll look for natural framing. And as you can see here, I shot through some rocks on this here. But all the while, I want to be able to tell a story. So I'm thinking about my imagery from the standpoint of what can I tell the story with. In this particular image, we have the beautiful clouds. And what's nice about this location is the palette changes every single day because the sand moves. So any footprints that might have been there the day before are gone. And with that, it creates, a, you, I cannot go back and repeat the exact same image in a location like this. And the other thing is I'll look for little vignettes as opposed to the big picture. I want you to see the big picture, but then I start to focus in on the little and smaller parts of it. Here's an example where, look at the patterns on this. See the line that take you into the photograph. The, my, we talked about the primary and secondary subject. The primary subject is the white uh, like pumice rock that you see there. And then hopefully your eye will travel through the image into the mountains in the background and the big sky that you see there. Uh, again, if there's an opportunity to catch a starburst, I'm going to crouch down and see if I can get a composition in a way, be very sensitive to highlights and shadows because that's a challenging part, that fine balance. And that's why for me, shooting manual or aperture priority 
it gives me the ability to, to control it as best as I can. So this is uh, another example where I did go back the next day to try to photograph this. But you see all of the sand that's around these images here, completely different. And it just, it, I couldn't repeat it, nor did I really want to. I was happy with the result that I was able to accomplish. And here's this big lake in the foreground of all of these uh, mountains in the background. I'm being sarcastic. That's all sand. That's the mirage we get in those very hot areas. This desert goes up to about 100 degrees during the day and below freezing at night. Nothing lives there. But again, for me, one of the most magical places I've ever seen. Very difficult to get to. Requires four-wheel uh, drive vehicles. You have to have two because inevitably one gets stuck in it. So again, if you're doing this, make sure you're with a guide that understands it. But some of the real magic then occurs at night. Now remember, I'm in the southern hemisphere, so the stars are a little different than what I might be normally used to seeing. And you'll notice there's two prominent stars in the upper left and the upper right. And I use the rock formation in the front to help me tee that up so I could kind of align that with it. So the question that begs to be asked too is, how did I light the, uh, the rock in the front there? I didn't, Mother Nature did that. I had a half moon over my shoulder. Again, conditions were perfect, and yet I'm able to capture all those stars and making those alignments. You see the little slot on the left-hand side. I wanted to get that, uh, that star right that was prominent in there. Now here's one where I had a little man-made help. As I mentioned, we had two vehicles, and we asked the one guy, we had a walkie-talkie, he said, go over there and hit your headlights just for a second because I wanted to capture the Milky Way. But again, without a foreground element, without that layer part of it, the image can be nice, but it's still not as interesting. So using a little creativity and a little man-made object in that respect helped me to produce that image. So the one country that I travel to the most is India. And for me, it's one of my favorite locations. I just, I've been north, south, east, and west, every part of this area. Uh, this is in Kashmir. Uh, very troubled part of the world, and it's, it's probably very difficult to go there now because it's, it's really not that safe. I'm on the border of Pakistan here. I'm about as far north up as you can go in the mountains, just absolutely enjoying the serenity of this because there was very, very few people. And you think of a country like India, most people don't have that perception. Here's another example where I was uh, wandering by myself through this area. There's these, these beautiful homes, but it, Again, you notice we talked about balance, we talked about uh, you know, mood, if you will. All those things I'm thinking about when I'm looking for that photographic opportunity. So atmosphere is really one of the things I enjoy when I'm out photographing and this very moody day. There was a break in the sky and we were traveling to a different location and you'll see the one sliver in the mountain that has the light hitting it. I am always looking for that type of opportunity where there's just a peak of light. That is my primary subject. But yet, I still have layers in the imagery and uh, still accomplishing what I'm, what I'm trying to get to. As I'm leaving uh, that upper area up near the Pakistani border, this is traveling back into um, Kashmir. And you know, again, looking down this, I did not see it coming up because again, I'm facing the other way message there, of course, look over your shoulder. And beautiful, uh, you know, serenity of, of this whole area, just a really, a lovely, lovely location. So some of the areas, though, are a little bit challenging. I mentioned about having a guide who knows the turf, knows the area. These are the road conditions that we would travel in, so you do not want to attempt this without somebody that knows the turf. Um, in many of the images here in that part of the country, I'm up between 12,000 and 17,000 feet. And uh, again, if you like atmospheric conditions, it, it's an ideal place to capture this. And you can see there's a gentleman walking two horses down this road, and I'm completely engulfed in the, in the clouds that are there. But again, waiting for that magic moment to go in there where you can capture that. So people look at this and say, is this uh, Tibet, is this Bhutan? And no, this is Northern India. This is what it's like there, very, very sparse area. But we talked about that balance part to the photography. You notice we have a heavy weight on the right, a little bit of heavy weight on, on the left. So we're able to get that balance. I wanted the fringe of the prayer flags blowing in the wind with the foreground elements. Again, layers, balance, and all those components blending together. But it's also important to have a an order of magnitude to understand how big these are. 
So in this particular case, there were two vehicles that were traveling with us. And if you look to the right in that crevice, you'll see if you look closely, there's a white car. And that hopefully will give you an idea of the size of these mountains that are in this part of the world. And again, I did that as an establishing shot. So you, the audience, have an idea of what type and size that we're looking at. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing to see some of this. And if you didn't know better, you might think this was out in the Midwest. Again, the northern areas uh, up in the Leh and Ladakh area of India, just a, an incredible location. So this is an image that I use when I'm doing teaching on layers in particular. And if you take time and study this image, you could probably count in excess of a dozen layers in this. The zone as that structure on that mountain is called is my primary subject. But if you look through this, you will see there's a whole series of layers, the beautiful mountains leading back into, of course, the sky that's there. So again, you'll, you're going to get the, the hint here that that's an important part, at least as far as how I do things. So I mentioned about having that right guide. Well, we thought we did, but we ended up getting stuck. Unfortunately, there was a little construction camp that was nearby, and these guys were kind enough to, uh, to bail us out. So importance of the people you're with. South India, this is around uh, Chennai and Kerala. Beautiful and extremely opposite uh, from where I was in the previous images. I'm on the water. Everything in Kerala, for the most part, you, you travel on boat that's around here. So I look for those nice daytime shots. There's a storm behind it, again, creating that mood, atmospheric thing that I'm looking for. And then fast forward by a couple of hours, almost in the same location, here I am just over my shoulder looking at, again, a completely different image. And you'll notice that there's a boater in the lower left-hand corner there. He was, and I, I had my composition set, waited for him to move into the frame, and then I have about a two or three second time frame in order to capture that. So of course, timing is important. So all the years that I've been going to um, India, everybody said, well, did you ever go to Taj Mahal? And it wasn't until just before COVID that I thought, you know, I should do that. So part of that scouting, this is, you know, of course, the Taj Mahal, but that's not what I wanted. But I used the time before this to scout it out, to see what my options would be. And I learned you can't get in ahead of time. There's nothing you could do. And the next morning, I got up an hour or two before, before the, the place opened up. I wanted to be the first person in there. And as fast as I could, I knew I wanted to at least try to get the iconic shot. And this is what I was able to accomplish. Because a minute or two later, tons and tons of people. So again, if you're going to any of those iconic places, the early bird clearly catches the, catches the worm here. This is in Rajasthan. Uh, and again, if I quick throw a plug, I'm going to be going there in February. If anybody's interested in wanting to see some of this, you know, check out my website. It's going to be an amazing opportunity. But that balance part, there's a fort on the left, there's a palace on the left, and you want to have that balance. Again, for me, a very important part of this. So I talked before about separation. This is also in Rajasthan. And these herders were there. And I don't speak the language, but through gesture, you know, you can try to communi a little, communicate a little bit. But I wanted to capture them in their environment, but I can't ask them to move and pose for me. So I have to be the person moving about. And I was very careful. And if you look between the two gentlemen, the gentleman holding the, the, uh, the, the crutch there and the sheep, I worked real hard to move myself so none of those would overlap. So that was the point I was making about separation. So when you're looking at an image like this, you're not going to be in a position to change the scene. You have to change the scene by moving yourself. So again, be sensitive to that sort of opportunity. So let's move on to Cuba, another fun place to photograph, lots of colors. This is a part of the country where over my shoulder, you know, is the kind of the iconic shots. That's not what I wanted. I wanted a shot that would depict Cuba as I think I perceived it in my mind. This is actually about a six stitched image. I'm on the roof of one of the buildings there. And again, just trying to get all those elements together and a, a bit of a telephoto because I wanted to compress it a little bit. But again, by taking all of those, I'm able to get all of those elements in there. So for anybody who's been to Cuba, the main area there is called the Malacan, which is you know, an area where everybody meets and greets. And 
And of course, I wanted to get a couple shots, and I'm looking out into the water, and I'm looking at that lighthouse, the clouds, everything was lining up. But the one thing I was thinking about, it's kind of odd, there's no boats in the water. Well, it's Cuba, you're not allowed to do that. So as I looked at this image, though, I saw that lighthouse, I wonder if I could gain access. So the last day that I was there, I was able to get up into the uh, lighthouse, and here's the result. This was my last day there. Mother Nature delivered this beautiful sky for me. That's the Malacan that you see down in the bottom part of this thing here. Again, you can't time all that, but you can certainly try to capture it if the opportunity presents itself. So this is a shot that, this isn't really a landscape shot, but it's a shot that I think kind of depicts the elements of Cuba, and specifically Havana, the old car, the carts, the people gathering, all the telephone and electrical lines overhead. So this is actually an image that uh, back in the day Olympus used in, in part of their marketing campaign. So let's take it to a different part of the world. Let's travel to Bhutan, uh, an incredibly beautiful part of the world. The hap it's, I don't know if it's the happiest place in the world, but in the top they kind of rank themselves, their there's success by a happiness factor. This is a, uh, an, a scene that I saw the fog all engulfed around the tree, saw the player, prayer flags, I knew the sky was going to burn through. This was about a 15 second opportunity and 16, six, 17 seconds later, the fog that you see around the starburst there was gone. You can't repeat it, so when you have those opportunities, obviously you, want, you, don't, want to, you don't want to miss out on that. So Tiger's Nest, and some of you may be familiar with that, again, one of those iconic locations. So from afar, I looked at that and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm hiking up there, and yep. And I was thinking about as I'm hiking up there, how do I create a compelling image? What do I do from a compositional standpoint to make it interesting to you guys? And I saw those flags that were leading into that, and I thought, well, if I get myself positioned right, I can make the flags create a leading line, so hopefully it takes you right into the tiger's nest, and that's how I accomplished that. I will tell you, two and a half hours later, I was huffing and puffing on this one. This was a, this was a tough one. So during that same trip, uh, going, I like to go down into the villages and kind of mingle with the people, and I saw this lovely bridge with the background elements that you see there, and of course, at the risk of redundancy, the layers in here. But I thought, let's get over to the bridge and see if we can't get this even a little closer up. So I saw the prayer frags. I wanted to shoot it from the side, and here it is. And I caught this uh, young monk walking through. And if you look in the lower left, you'll see there's one leaning on the post. And on the right-hand side of the image, the flags are blowing into the bridge. Again, the point there is see the distance, see the shot from the distance, you know, get that image, but work the image and try and find some other angles that can make it even more compelling. So if any of you ever travel with me, you'll, I'm the guy in the car who says, wait, stop, we've got to pull over. And these are sort of the things that I look for. So again, in the high mountains in an area like Bhutan, atmospheric conditions, beautiful, lovely trees, trying to make that composition work, but not letting those opportunities slip by. Again, here's, here's an example where the fog's up at the top. I use the, uh, the, uh, the uh, zon in the foreground as you know, my main subject, and then the, the mountains and the fog and, and everything else then becomes secondary to that. So let's travel to Mongolia, uh, amazing place. I went to Western Mongolia, which there is very rarely we see anything man-made. Uh, but in this image, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? You see the layers? And look at all the different colors too. And unfortunately, I didn't have a dramatic sky, but I had a sky that I could at least work with. And complementing, we talked about, you know, the, the contrast with colors and light. And this image, I hope, depicts that. And if you look real closely in the lower right and left, you'll see a little uh, uh, girt that uh, the nomads will pick up and move on a periodic basis. And so I wanted to give you the shot in that regard. But what's interesting is it's so barren. And this is as far as I could see in 360 degrees, there's nothing man-made about that. But I went there with, the, with a different purpose and a different intent. I wanted to photograph the eagle hunters. So I have a whole series on that. I'm not here to, to show the, share those with you, but that's the reason why I was here. And just wonderful human beings. And again, it's, a, it's an art that's dying. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to make the point to, uh, to go there. So staying in Mongolia, 
Here's an image of the Milky Way. And there's a handful of places in the world that I've been to where I felt like I could almost touch the Milky Way. And this is one of those locations. So again, how do I create a layer? How do I create a foreground element? And we had this tent. And what I did is I just took a little candle, put it inside the tent. So I'd have some layering to give me the a foreground along with the beautiful Milky Way. And uh, that's the result of the shot. And that's where I stayed. This is one of those live composites I was telling you about. This is a three hour exposure, hit the initial uh, release. And what live composite does is basically only measures new light. So anything new light that comes in and then it'll never burn out, if you will. So I hit my flashlight for a little bit on the, uh, on the foreground girt that's there, went to bed, Three hours later, I set my alarm, got up, and this is the result of the uh, three-hour wait time. Obviously, I look for the, the, uh, the Northern Star to give me uh, you know, a reference point. So Iceland, I'm sure many of you have traveled there and you've seen a lot of images there. So during my travels there, I always am looking at the light. And if you look at this image, you can't tell where the light's coming from. And it was one of those rare opportunities where I could see the light bouncing back and forth off all of these different ice elements there and again trying to find the composition fortunately because they're bouncing off there was an automatic layering that's already in place so i was able to take advantage of that again another location in in iceland this i wanted a slow shutter speed the um the water was receding at this point in the day back to the ocean i had a little bit of light left so i tried to find a, a location from a compositional standpoint where i could take advantage of that smooth out the water, hopefully your eye travels right into the back of those uh, beautiful rock formations along with the sky that you see there. So when I'm in an area uh, that I've not been to before, in this particular case, I'm at a glacier, I will sometimes take a video just so I can share that with you guys and also share with you what my mind is doing when I'm in an area. As I'm panning, I'm looking, and that thing in the lower left hand corner of the image really caught my eye. So I thought I'm going to make that my primary subject. And you look at this and the colors don't seem right, but I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that was what was going on there. Incredible blues. And again, I wanted to make that main focus point, that alien looking structure with the mother nature delivered a beautiful sky right behind it. But as I looked at these and the glaciers, I also like to take little vignettes. And so I moved into different parts of it. And these things are probably 30, 40 feet in height, just to put it in perspective. But without a man-made element there, you can't really tell what the size of these are. And here's one, you've heard of Diamond, uh, Diamond Beach there. And this was an image that I really had challenged and I said to myself, I wanna figure out how to do that. That's one of those icebergs that is, with each wave, it kept falling over and then coming back up and falling over. I liked it. I wanted to capture the water just before it hit the iceberg. I wanted a slower shutter speed. And you know you can't do that if you're going to have something that's moving all the time. So there was that fine balance of catching the ice, the water, just before it. And I'm not going to kid you. It wasn't, I didn't do it, get it on the first shot. It took me a couple shots to finally nail it down. But I was able to do that. So um, arguably one of the largest. Um, Waterfalls, not arguably, it is the largest uh, waterfall area in Iceland. And people ask me, what time of the year do I go? So for a lot of people, it's not appealing, but I will find out what is the coldest days of the year. Um, and the reason being is I find it's going to give me the best compositional opportunities with snow and ice and also a few amount of people. So that's my sweet spot in a location like this. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner of this image, you'll see there's one person in the image. And in a place like Iceland, it's really gotten crowded now. So it's a rarity to be able to find that opportunity. And of course, you're not going to go to a place like this without capturing some of the aurora borealis. But again, same uh, techniques that I mentioned early on apply foreground, midground, background. You want to have all of that uh, in check when you're looking to do an image like this. So. On one of the trips, I wanted to focus on the ice caves. And this is a quick video inside one of the caves. But what I'm doing is I'm focusing on the textures and the patterns in the cave as opposed to the big picture. I still want to get some shots of the big pictures. But I started to focus on just little vignettes and pockets and corners. 
And it was just amazing to me if, if there was a blue tiger, this is what it would look like to me, if you will. And it had the coarseness and there was some frost around it. Same time, just moved 10 feet away and you have this silky soft glass. Uh, but yet, I still want to put it in context. So what I want to do is then I asked two of the guys who were with me to stand at the opening to the cave so I could give you, the audience, an idea of where I am in a sense of place, if you will. So again, that guy in the car, he's driving along and I yell, wait, stop the car. This is another example. This is a quick video right after I jumped out of the car. I saw this body of water. It's really not a body of water. It's actually ice. But just the size of it was amazing and I wanted to go down to the water's edge and see if I could find a composition. So I ran down there and again looking for those layers, looking for foreground element. The skies in, in Iceland, if you catch it right, just do magic and you can see the reflections in the ice, the main part of the ice, of course, juxtapositioned with the foreground and then ultimately the uh, mountain in the background. So here's an old farm I found and again in this case I'm using what is called daytime live composite. I put a 10 stop ND filter on. I, this is probably about uh, a two minute exposure. I wanted mother nature to paint the sky for me. And uh, I thought the structure was lovely and you know the road was right behind me so it was relatively close. But a lot of times what I'll do is after I look at this I think sometimes the color could be distracting. Let's focus more on the composition and by doing that I, I convert it into a black and white. Again, I like both of them, you decide, but those are some of the thought processes that I'm looking at or pondering when I'm out and about. Now here, if you look at the bottom of this image, this is not gonna win any awards. What this is, is again, to give you an idea of place. That's an ice island that's probably about three or four blocks long, and I thought, man, that looks interesting. I don't know how safe it is, but I'm gonna go down there. I found some of the most amazing structures on this floating block of ice. These things look like time machines. The sky got crazy on me and these openings and I have to assume these things just jutted up through the ice and of course this is one of those situations where I mentioned earlier you're not going to go back next year and try to duplicate the photograph because it's not going to exist anymore. So again at the risk of redundancy on that also if you have the opportunity and you're interested in exploring check it out. This is an, one of the iconic locations there. Everybody says, well, why'd you make the water so blue? I didn't make the water so blue. This is exactly how it is. But you can't really tell the height and size of these. And so well, maybe what I should do is zoom in a little bit and get a more of a vignette of that. And to put it in perspective that those walls are probably about 20 feet in height. Of course, I'm shooting a slower shutter speed. I wanted to create that dreamy effect but it's still not giving you a real sense of place. So what I decided, I'm gonna hike down to the base of one of those, take some of the ice features, make that my foreground element and still get the water in the background. Again, just as part of my storytelling to give you an idea of how I was able to capture that. So my last day in Iceland, I'm leaving. I see somebody just freshly plowed the snow in this image that you see here. Look at the beautiful leading line into the church, Mother Nature's given me this incredible sunset. Again, one of those opportunities, pull the car over the side of the road. And again, it's amazing some of the things that you can find. So just this past year, I had an opportunity to spend some time out uh, in the Pacific Northwest. This is the Ho Rainforest in Washington State. I could spend hours and hours in this place. And it's almost overwhelming when you're doing rainforest or things like that what's your subject? There's so much chaos and it's try to, trying to reduce that chaos down. Picking a primary subject, trying to get the composition and my attempt here, wanted to get that star burst that was peeking through there. Of course I've closed down my aperture to get that. And then the tree, the fern, and then the secondary parts of it lead back in. So again when I'm looking for an opportunity like this, that's what's going through through my head. Uh, this is in Oregon, Smith Mountain beautiful, beautiful mountain range. It was just the colors in the sky were magical, but I was waiting for the light to hit the mountains themselves and it wasn't quite doing it. So I thought what I would do, I'll go down to the water's edge and see if I can't find something else of interest. And in this particular case, there was some wild roses that were growing and I used focus stacking so that I could get both that rose, which is only you know a foot away from my lens, 
in tack sharp along, I want the grass, I want the mountains, I want the clouds, everything else to be tack sharp. So again, I did some focus stacking in order to accomplish what my goal is with this. So climbing up on some rocks, again, I love the atmosphere. Again, some of these may not be the smartest ideas I've had, but a little bit of a short uh, time frame. You can see there's some water in that puddle that you see on either side here. And yes, I got wet, but I was very happy with the results. So you got to get the iconic stuff along the Oregon coastlines. And this is one of those where, again, trying to find that natural frame, the beautiful green grass that's on top of the mountain. But I wanted more. So I mentioned about being curious. I mentioned about being creative. So all of that wood that's on the shoreline, I thought to myself, let's go exploring that. And maybe I could peek underneath one of these pieces of wood and remember that green top just for a minute. And I could find my golden egg underneath there. Well, sure enough, I peeked underneath and I found that stone wedged between the wood and the way the light was bouncing off, there was my golden egg. Now do you recognize the greenery in the background there? I have layers. I, but because of my curiosity, I'm able to find images like that. So again, open your mind when you're in these locations. Let's take a quick run over to Lofoten in um, uh, the uh, fishing villages here and beautiful part of Norway. To me, this is kind of like how Iceland was 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's going to start seeing more people because obviously it's getting a lot of PR. Just a magical place to photograph. Similar composition opportunities uh, that you have in Iceland, but not near the amount of crowds. But at the same time, there's not near the amount of amenities. And so if you're willing to forego some of the amenities, you can find some really wonderful opportunities. Um, this is a, a fun shot of these, you know, uh, I don't know how many, eight, 10 uh, of these residential red units. I did a 60 second exposure because I wanted the water to flat and I wanted the sky. So people ask me what's the largest enlargement I ever made, and if I can just pause for a minute here, I have, uh, I, this was uh, reproduced at 60 feet long, and I'm being a little sarcastic because they made it into a billboard. It was an art contest that I entered it into. So I have this image at 60 feet long. So somebody has said, well, you can't really make a large print with a micro four thirds. I'm here to debate that with you. So if you want to go bigger than 60 feet, you should probably re reconsider it then. So I hike up here and I see, all these fish. So what they do is they hang the fish to dry in anticipation of the preparation that's necessary. And I, I thought to myself, well, how do I create an interesting element there? Make note of that rock formation in the back. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go down there and silly me, I'd figure I'm going to just walk underneath, get a couple of video, get some video shots of this. Do not do this unless you're prepared to spend an hour or two in your room when you get back cleaning off your jacket. So not a smart move on my part. But what I did do is I came back out. This is what I wanted to get. I wanted all those fish heads that are hanging there staring at me. And remember I said, remember that mountain range in the back. That's the back. And that beautiful hue of uh, orange and gold over the top because the storms keep moving in and out on a frequent basis. Here's an early morning shot. You know, just love the rays. Look at the color of the water. And again, you're not going to get that at noon in the day, but also in introducing those same el compositional elements that I mentioned early on. So this is a pretty iconic shot anymore now. So this is a, a, one of the fishing uh, villages and you see the boat going back and I call that, you know, running from the storm because there was a storm coming in. I had my preconceived idea. I wanted to photograph this with a slow shutter speed and I see this storm approaching and I, I was able, I set up my tripod, got the shot but that's not what I wanted. I wanted to wait for the lights to go on inside the building. So I waited a little bit longer. Things started to change. I changed my position ever so slightly. You see the beautiful color that was bleeding through in the back. Minute later, the storm comes in. I'm getting pelted with rain, snow, ice, sleet. If the, wind, if the lights ever went on, I have no idea. But anyway, I'm still happy with the results that came from this. Uh, here's an example where, again, I'm using the bridge as a leading line. There's a huge storm behind that mountain you see there. Uh, it got washed out a minute or two later, so don't hesitate again, as I say, the, when you have the opportunity to shoot this. Here's an example of where I wanted focus stacking. That little shell you see in the middle uh, of that kelp that's there, I wanted that sharp, I wanted the rock sharp, I wanted the water sharp, I wanted the mountain sharp, and I wanted the clouds to have all the definition. 
How do I do that? Again, I did some focus stacking in order to accomplish that. Uh, again, also, as you saw with Iceland, the beautiful uh, Aurora Borealis. I wanted a foreground element. The frozen lake that you see in the foreground worked great because it gave me great reflections on that. So real quick on to um, uh, the Dolomites. If you ever have the chance, you have to see this location. It's beautiful. You've probably seen many of the iconic shots. I had an opportunity to test the OM5 uh, pre-production model to see how it would endure. These are 50 and 80 megapixel high res shots uh, that I'm taking with my little tiny camera that has given me results that have so much detail. Here's an example of one that again, wanted to create my own image. I've not seen this before. Early morning, the sun comes up and the colors that you see there, that's what was there. They only last a couple minutes, of course, and then, then they're gone. But again, some of the iconic shots, you'll notice where the light is on the mountains. You'll notice, of course, the little church that's there is, is lit and in the shadows. We have all those layers that are taking place in the, uh, in the image here. Um, daytime life composite. I let Mother Nature paint the sky for me. This is probably about a 35 to 45 second exposure. All done uh, compliments of Mother Nature for me, so I didn't have to do anything in post on that. Looking for those leading lines, you see the boats at the bottom. I wanted it to take you into the area. The, I was there in spring, which is their fall, because we're at the, you know, or excuse me, I was there at spring, which, yeah, was, was their fall. And the ice, the glacier that you see up on the left, I wanted your eye to travel into that area. So my last day there, we had one more sunrise that uh, we were gonna shoot, and this is an 80 megapixel. Uh, shot of this uh, incredible magical sky. Again, you can't time it, you can only be lucky with it and be prepared. So near here, and again, many of you have probably been to this location, and if it isn't obvious at first, I'll tell you what it is. I wanted to travel this, to this location for many, many years, never had the opportunity. Wanted to find a unique perspective of this location. I saw that heart in the pool, if you will, with the beautiful light all around it, also, again, shooting high res here because I didn't know if I had the opportunity. So this was my take on a different shot at a location that probably many of you know, which is Watkins Glen. I still wanted to capture the, uh, the iconic shot. The only way you're going to do these without a whole ton of work in Photoshop is get there in the parking lot before the sun comes up, get your tail up there, had a little bit of rain. It was perfect missed day on that. So the real challenge with some of my equipment is in places like Patagonia. So I was there just a few months ago, a magical, magical location, but a real test of equipment. Uh, of course, you wait. Mother Nature changes. This is in Tordellas Piney. The light is hitting just at the right moment, so I had to wait for that golden hue, and that's when I want to capture it. But let's move a little bit. This is, again, the iconic shot. Let's go down closer to the water on a different day than I shot it. And again, same location, I'm probably 100, 200 feet away, but you have a completely different view and vision of this just by changing what is relatively a short, short distance. This is the back side of it. And again, this is another focus stacked image where I wanted the, uh, the driftwood that you see there and that stone structure in the center. Those are my layers for the image and true confession, I did move the driftwood a little bit to make it work to my benefit, but uh, again, that's part of, part of getting that, that right image, if you will. So here's the real magic. So this is a two o'clock in the morning uh, hike up to this area that, again, just blew my mind. Probably one of the prettiest spots I've ever seen. And this is two images though. The, the bottom foreground, I'm using, I had about a two minute exposure because I wanted some definition of that. I can't light it because it's really far away. And then the Milky Way, uh, I shot that. That's about uh, 20 second exposure. Of course, blend them together and this is what we had. So I can pack my gear and leave, but wait a minute. This location has magic that I have never seen anywhere else in the world. So an hour or two later, this is what showed up. And so people said, well, is this mid journey? You know, did you do, you know, what did you do? It's like, no, this is what was there. The colors you see, the skies that you see. Well, thank you.
But anyway, a very magical place. So the point to that is don't be tempted to leave too early. So a few more shots of that same location. Here I am getting a little closer. You can see the skies is starting to change a little bit more because the sun's coming up. Let's back up a little bit more and maybe get the two mountains together. And here you can see the, the sky is becoming more and more illuminated. So that magic time, short opportunity, but again, it's amazing what you can do. So here's one I want you to just take a quick look at this. See this big body of water in the foreground and the mountains in the background. How did I do that? Well, again, as photographers, we can kind of trick the eye a little bit. And here I am photographing that little puddle that you see in the foreground there to get that in the background. And again, with a wide angle lens, you can create an illusion that most people can't see unless you're sticking your head down in there. So again, that's part of that creative part. Mount Fitzroy, a beautiful image. I saw the, the fence. I wanted to be a leading line to take me into that mountain. The next day I was going to be at the base of that mountain. Now it's fall there. Our spring is fall there. I have no idea what the colors are going to look like, what to expect. Again, up at two, three o'clock in the morning, hiking up in pitch dark. I have no idea what to expect. There's no opportunity to photograph, you know, or to scout it ahead of time. I get up there, the sun comes up and look at the colors. Oh my gosh, I was absolutely blown away. Found the location for the composition. The one challenge, the one thing I didn't care for is the, the cloud covered uh, Mount Fitzroy, the peak of it the whole time. A different vantage point just a few minutes later and look at the vibrancy of the fall color just magical. So as I leave Patagonia, let me take you to a place I just got back uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, my first time in New Zealand, a magical place. Uh, I was able to grab just a couple shots here I want to share with you. This is 10,000 ISO. Thank God for the sensors we have today and the post-processing abilities that we have that I'm able to create that. I mentioned I like atmospheric conditions. This is what I was able to capture in several locations. That's Mount Cook in the upper left. Another focus stacked image that's here. And uh, again, that guy in the car that yells, pull over. I saw the leading line for the, uh, the, the road that you see, or the pathway there leading me up to the sky. Again, I'm always looking for opportunities like that. Similar here with the beautiful fog that you see in the valleys and uh, the rainforest it's winter time there. It's, it's below freezing. I've never been in a rainforest before where I saw greenery like this. And again, here I'm using the ferns to create a leading line into my primary subject. And that's what my attempt was with this image here. And um, there was a woman in our group that had this beautiful red jacket. And I asked her, would you mind standing out in the peninsula of this mist that was on the water? She was kind enough to oblige. And as I Stroll down the stream of uh, New Zealand here, ladies and gentlemen, let me say thank you very much for your attention and your patience. We do have some time for a couple questions, but after this session, um, you can catch Frank outside the speaker meet and greet table um, to pick his brain a little bit more, maybe share a little bit of your work and your stories. So we're gonna start up front and then I'm gonna come to the back for two questions. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Are there any generalizations you can share about your post-processing -pro post um, style? You mentioned Photoshop filters, but just things you could do in Lightroom, saturation, sharpening. Absolutely. Great. The question is, you know, about the post-processing part of the imagery. So the, it actually has a precursor to the question that I feel is important is to get it right in the camera, number one. So I'm photographing for highlights, so my shadows are typically very deep, so I have, I don't, I'm not trying to struggle with that. But I, my workflow is, it goes into Lightroom, and uh, I do, is, and with the new masking algorithms that are in there, the bulk of what I'm completing now is all done within that realm. And then from there, if there's any little minor cleanups, what I do is then I'll take it into Photoshop. But I would say 75 to 80% of my workflow now is in Lightroom. Good question. Um, I wanted to ask, because uh, we saw a lot of photos from different times of day, do you have a favorite or a preference of time of day that you seem to get more sh shots? Well, yes, and the answer to that is morning. Even though I'm not a morning person, I push myself. That's where the magic happens. You saw in the, the, you know, where I did the Milky Way at night, just bled into the morning shots. 
Of course, the evening shots, I avoid the high noon times, but a lot of times we're delivered in an opportunity that we can't change. We have tools that uh, we can work with. You know, I do a lot of exposure bracketing in situations where I have challenges like that. And uh, again, be just being very sensitive to watching the, you know, the, the histogram and everything else. But morning is, is by far and away, for landscape, the sweet spot. Good question. Frank. Um, yes, sir. Could you get a little bit more technical about the focus stacking as far as like uh, lens and differential and? Sure. Yeah. So in the OM system, which I shoot, uh, I have mine preset for about a dozen shots. I rarely use a dozen of them. I will focus on my very closest point and it's automatic in the camera. It'll take two, two uh, exposures beforehand that'll come closer to me and then the remainder are to the rear. And then in Photoshop, what I'll do is I'll identify each one and decide which ones I'm going to stack and then I'll do it in post. I rarely use you know, what the end result camera would produce even though there's some really good stuff for that. But for the most part, I'll take it into post-processing and analyze it and then make the stack from there. Okay. The stacking part in Photoshop. Frank, when you said you're getting away from uh, tripods, but when you're photo stacking, are you more using a tripod? Nope. No. My, again, the image stabilization, you know, I've got eight stops of image stabilization and uh, I'm not worried about the blur and I've got enough that I can hold it steady. I'll pro I might position my hand on a rock or something and the little bit of movement I can correct in Photoshop. But yeah. One more time, a round of applause, Frank T. Smith. Thank you.